Welcome to the Inner Huddle, a youth football development podcast for parents, coaches, and managers of young aspiring footballers. Your hosts from Pezza Street Soccer are Pez and Jeff. Hello, and welcome to the Inner Huddle. Um, I'm joined on location today with Jeff Bonner and Betsy Tuffrey. Is there a magic age range? where children develop most of their habits for life. Wow. No. No, okay. <laughs> no, so, well, in, in the topic of what is a habit, it is, right. it is a learnt behaviour yeah. and it's something that's become automatic through reinforcement, basically. Yes. Yeah. Um, so you can, have a, you can develop a habit at any stage in life. I think... It's one of those qu- trick questions, that, isn't it? Because a yeah. habit is a learned... Thing yeah, it is. Of time. Yeah, I think in terms of like child development age okay, ranges, yeah, yeah. and in terms of psychology, I think that that's forms part of the reason why I think psychology should be tailored really early, um, because the the awareness is there from an early age. So a lot of the players that I I deal with now at Portsmouth have, have had no exposure to psychology until maybe they saw me at fifteen, sixteen, yeah. and then I'm starting at the point that. I should have started when they were nine. Yes. So... Do you have to, when you start, unravel a lot of stuff, stripping it back to base and then go again, or...? Yeah. It... Yeah, because they, they've got... I don't want to use the word habit now, but bad habits. Yeah, um, I, I think... Yeah, habits is a tricky word to use, yeah. actually. But I think just their norms. Norms, what, OK. What they found normal in terms of, like, the psychology that they use now, or... It's a, that's a difficult question, actually. I think... Yeah. In terms of habits like performance habits and maybe the way they respond to things, so young players that start reacting to referees and things like that. Yes. If we're calling that a habit, I think... It's difficult to know without knowing the context of what yeah. they had in mind when they wrote the question, I guess. I mean, we probably all thought different when we read it. Yeah, I think... Um, we could stop that at any age. So it's yeah. like if your child has developed a habit that is problematic to performance that is changeable and that certainly the way I work so I'm a cognitive behavioral psychologist which means my perspective is that child has a thought the thought influences the behavior the behavior affects the performance yeah so what is the thought is that is the first point of action and and those thoughts and beliefs are changeable so any habit that you think your child might have developed or um, be it a bad habit or a good habit is a learned behavior so therefore it is able to be altered yeah so I think in terms of if the person writing this question has thought maybe maybe my child has developed the habit and you know it's a lost cause now then that's not the case yeah it's, yeah you can interpret this many ways I yeah I interpret it as a positive good thing is there a golden age for for uh, I mean we say five to seven year old or year olds for for getting the motor patterns in and things yeah. for actual football development that's how I read it yeah but it could be okay it a won't... bad habit of referees it could be putting too much emphasis on scoring goals rather than the process of scoring yeah. goals and the outcome it could be it's endless really isn't it I think I'd probably say about nine I guess the only thing I can relate it to psychology wise is um d- different age range Ch- children will um associate success and failure with different things at different ages so often um sort of 11 years of age roughly children will be thinking that their um, performance their, their negative performance isn't necessarily down to them and yeah. they're not as affected potentially by the, the older players yeah. who then tend to think that this is my fault and it means I'm absolutely useless so I think probably 9 to 11 is a really malleable age in terms of like what psychology we're getting in then yeah. and what are their early thought patterns because they're the ones being reinforced for years yes. so when they get to me at 15 years old yeah. they, they've potentially already got quite a rational way of thinking and interpreting their emotions and their mistakes and, and how they apply their efforts so I think, yeah, there isn't a magic age range as, no. far, as far as I'm aware <laughs> Interesting, but I think I think that sort of nine to eleven age range for yeah. psychology. I suppose five to sevens for us is the magic age for, like, say, getting in what we say our core skills are and their motor patterns. And they're like sponges at that age, and yeah. the more they do, the better they get. And yeah. that stays with them for for life. But if they played games, as soon as it's finished at that age, it's over and they don't bother them. 
Yeah. And like you say, from 9 to 11, they might start affecting the rest of their day and sort of analysing it and, oh, it was my fault the goal went in. Or So I suppose the psychology that does start then. Very interesting, Jeff. Very, very interesting. Never broken it down like that before. <laughs> right, question 10, go on. Do you come across many pushy parents and what's your advice for both the children and parents in this situation? Okay, so we've probably covered quite a bit of yeah, this. Yeah, I think we've done most of this one. But. Um, I suppose in summary, yes, I have come across pushy parents. Um, but I think in, in the parents' defence, this is often for all the right reasons. Yes. They, they want their child to succeed more often than not. Um, and they, their pushiness is a reflection of their focus on their child, their commitment to their child's development. Um, I think there certainly needs to be more awareness on the parent's side um, mm. as to how their behaviours influence in their child and that can come from the psychologist and it can come from the coach and it can come from a pyramid of the three is probably the most effective yeah. way to use that. Again, it would be slightly different for if this person's writing about a five-year-old or writing about a yeah. 15 or a scholarship type age. It can be all different again. There's no real context with it. Exactly. But, as like you, I put yes a lot. Obviously. Yeah. We deal with it all the time, don't we? Even yeah. if they don't know that they're being pushy. So, like you say, that awareness is key. But I always, I mean, I've written it here. My advice is always to work out what you want from it. What, what's your end vision? So I put, visualise how you'd like your child to behave in 10 years' time. So if you want your child to be confident, still playing, still enjoying the sport, um, even if it, you know, there's no rights or wrongs it, it could be you want them to be a professional, playing at the highest level. And however you picture your child are they popular you know you know are they going out are they got friends and then you have to match your actions to it because if your actions aren't matched to it if what you're doing could possibly stop them from enjoying the game stop their confidence and then you've got to think oh actually i'm i might be doing something wrong here yeah and i think that can be quite powerful if you say to them, if you carry on like this how do you think it's going to end up but what do you want it to end up yeah and then and then simple match your actions to whatever you whatever you want from it yeah but at some point it changes from what you want to what your child wants and then you've got to match it up to both of them so it's not quite as easy as that I think a lot of parents would probably say that they all they really want is for their child to be happy all um, of them say it but their behaviour is perhaps not um, yes. aligned with that at all times so it's a perfect example so we get it a lot we just want them to be happy and enjoy it but they're not so why are they not? Because you're analysing in the car on the way home. You're not letting them go to McDonald's afterwards because they've lost. Dad's grumpy all weekend because you've lost a game. Yeah. And your body language, and this, that, and the other. And the risk is they kids then have an attachment or think that the only way they're going to get their dad's love is through results, winning games. Yeah. or scoring all my performance and then that's a very dangerous yeah that's an unhealthy um, place to be very unhealthy place to be I think the, the, the other situation I've come across um, in my career so far is parents who are either ex-professionals or uh, yes. um, not a few of those yeah have, have links have links with, with the children some or young adults in, yeah. in my case mostly but that's a difficult situation to balance because they, the parent might be extremely knowledgeable yes. about their child's development and their own experiences, but they're also basing those experiences on something that happened maybe 20, 30 years ago. Yeah. Um, and things have changed. And the, the quote I hear all the time from particularly ex-professionals is, we didn't have that in my day, or I didn't need all of that psychology rubbish. And yet, actually, a lot of the things they talk about are all based on psychology. Yeah. Um, so I think that... A parent that has been involved in elite football is potentially a difficult parent to manage. Yeah. Um, having said that, I've come across the odd one that's actually a, a better example of a performance parent, if you like, because they don't want to put the pressure on their child that they maybe felt when they were a pro. Yeah. So that's a difficult... I think it's really naive and dangerous if you think just because you made it and had a career that you know everything about all the developmental stages yeah. of your child's growth. And depending on the profile of that ex-pro, yeah. that's a difficult situation for the child. So yeah. they're, they're going through a club maybe where their name's associated with the yeah. ex-pro. or it's a lot to deal with. Their peers think they're treated differently because they are yeah. the son of whoever. Or they're going to get a contract at their dad's club who's managing down the road. 
Yeah. I think that's a that's a difficult one for the for the child. Yeah, it's um, pressure again, and anxiety can come into that, and yeah. it, it can can spiral. But yeah, I think I think most, from my experience being in the game, most professionals think that they are experts in football development because they made it. I don't, and I can see why. But we, we always think that. It's only football, don't we? And we always think, oh, I bet it's not like this if you're a tennis coach. And yeah. You don't have parents. Knows, but, yeah. but I expect it's exactly the same across all sports. And I don't know how. I think the downside with is. football is. Um, everyone's an expert. Everyone's an expert. And <laughs> as much as football, in so many ways, is so far on from other sports in terms of the development and, and sports science and all of that stuff. It's also the most backward sport in other senses, particularly psychology. Yeah. And that varies between clubs, depending on who's in charge and whether they're interested in psychology or not. Yeah. Um, but I think football is unique in that sense and not like any other sport I've worked in, in terms of I think we get stuck in that old school ex-pro. Yeah. And a lot of ex-pros it, are managing and coaching and that... that I think that'll get almost better. straight away some of them, aren't they? Because it... Yeah. When I started, it used to be if a manager got sacked, his whole team would go with him. He'd come in and he'd bring his mates in. and So you were pretty much at the mercy of who was coming in and what mates they were bringing with him, you know, their jobs for the boys type thing. I think it's a bit different from that now. These clubs seem to have a lot more structure. So if you've <coughs> got a role at a club, you tend to be in that role and the manager goes and a new manager comes in and he has to pretty much work with the staff, except for his, Normally, is direct number two. Everyone else pretty much stays, so you've got more In my experience, job security. Not, really not? Yeah, it stays quite fluid Does in it? terms of it. Yeah, the manager um, yeah, tends to bring in people that Still. he's used to. Yeah. Um, so it's an insecure employment, really, in many senses. And I think that, that leaves clubs vulnerable in terms of the, the constant and, and what players are used to and whether the whole philosophy of what the club's doing changes yeah, it when changes the in an instant changes. Oh, right I, I was under the impression it was getting much better it has at the I mean I've only really been involved with Charlton Athletic and Southampton Football Club and yeah, they in, seem to be much better in my better. experience not it's that even even within the academy there'd be a lot of I mean I'm, I'm going to Brighton and that's where my old manager was and that's that there's yeah, the, there but then there's there is here's an argument that that's great because then there's a trust and you know yeah. you can work together and get things done yeah but it is not a great environment if you're constantly worried that the manager's going to get sacked because you've lost three games on the trot and yeah. you know that the new manager's going to come in and you're going to be... And even if that's happening in first team, it does impact on the academy, particularly if the philosophy of play changes yeah. or um, you know, formation. In the academies I've worked at, the formation is reflected in first team because that's how they want the players to progress. Yeah. So they're, then players in the academy go through changes because the first team manager has changed so yeah potentially that go- goes down even further than first team crikey <laughs> <laughs> well there we go right move on this is taking putting in some good work here aren't we Jeff? Yeah. right what number are we on 11 is it? 11 right I'll go for it one of the things we are aware of at Pezzas that's us Jeff is the need to allow children to develop a growth mindset. We're big on this, aren't we? Yeah. Um, can you explain a little bit about it? And I hope that's well, directed at you more, more, more than us. Um, um, so a growth mindset would be um, players interpreting challenges and mistakes differently, in my view. So yes. is a player we enjoying challenge? We have a model challenge? here that we use, yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so growth mindset... Skills come from hard work, can always be developed and improved, yeah. you know, accept challenges, um, realise they have to put effort in, obviously I'm not going to read it all, accept feedback um, as positive and something they can learn from, um, and how they deal with setbacks. Um, I think with the effort um, continuum, I think it's players with a growth mindset realising that applied effort will affect their development in a positive way. Often players with a really fixed mindset will think no amount of effort is going to change my level of talent yeah. so therefore I don't need to apply any effort yeah. and potentially I look much cooler if I don't put any effort in right now so there's 
Yes. And that, that is not what you want to see as a coach or a psychologist. No. So it, that... It's massively interesting, isn't it? We see it all the time. Yeah. For, for the very nature of our style of training, you can pick them out within half an hour, can't you? The easiest one to do is say, we're going to be working on your weak foot now for the next half an hour and you can see separate straight them instantly mm-hmm. so you go oh and all that kind of body language and I'm rubbish with that foot and yeah. you can pick them out and it's good for us because then we know who we've got to give attention to and, and that uh, would be interesting from my point of view because you see um, the approach the people the players who approach and the players that avoid yes. so that's all to do with challenge and threat do you, if you if you pose something like that to players do they think okay great I'm going to get to work on my weak foot this is, yeah. this is good I can develop I can get better this is what I want or do you get a player going oh my god no I'm going to look rubbish in front of other people yeah. I'm going to fail frequently and that's going to damage my ego Yes. and therefore I'm going to avoid it by, by either um, let's pretend I'm injured I'm sure you've seen that one before yeah. yes yeah. frequently let's say that oh actually I don't feel very well or, or that, yeah. that's self handicapping so giving yourself a had one on Saturday didn't feel very well until the matches started mm-hmm. And then they were in, and can I join in now? I feel much better. I used to be like this when we had to do the bleep tests at school. But so that's a bit different, the bleep test, isn't it? Yeah. Injury onset. I think I've missed all of those throughout my life, so yeah, I can relate to that one. But it is fascinating because, like I say, what we do literally separates those mm. two mindsets um, pretty much instantly, doesn't it? You get the ones that hide in a corner and don't bother trying, you get the ones who are the best in their school or in the best in their class, but they know they might get shown up here to be not quite as good as everyone yep. says they are you know they used might to frustrate stuff. me so much with the players I played with they would just start messing around if there's a challenge they knew because that guess. protects their ego yeah. yes oh, well, I was messing around anyway so yeah I wasn't trying therefore yeah. it's not a reflection on my talent yeah yeah because yeah. you can get the fear of failure drive me mad yourself and you can get the fear of being shown up can't you so that's your ego yeah uh, yeah more of a social yeah issue like are my peers seeing me as as a failure right now and then there's the other one where you don't admit to yourself you know like but I, i'm the best player i can i'll score 10 goals in the matches yeah. i don't need to use my weak foot yeah because yeah. i'm good enough already and all that is it's the biggest thing that we're interested in i think and that's difficult to turn around massively massively and the biggest frustration for us because well. that attitude could be coming from anywhere that could yeah. be coming from a parent that actually any mistake they've made has been highlighted so they don't want to make mistakes anymore so their behavior is to avoid challenge yes it's there there's a I, I won't get this right now but there's a <laughs> quote that um i've used before and it's from the simpsons all oh, right well you've got and a diehard simpsons <laughs> fan here so i'm sure he knows the one it, it was I, I can't remember the quote <laughs> word for word but it's basically homer simpson saying um like I, i'm not going to try at that because if i don't try i won't fail yeah and that's so relatable particularly with with kids let's not even try and do that because if i haven't tried to do it then then nothing bad has happened and, and i often use a cricket example for this okay another so cricket as well you've got peter and paul and peter goes into bat and plays safety shots all day and never gets out and then you've got paul who takes a few calculated risks scores much more in terms of runs but gets out quicker or he gets out so therefore yeah. that that is failure in factual yeah. sense and this guy Peter has not is that the way right? <laughs> uh, this guy's not point. failed at yeah. all. Yeah. And actually who who has failed? Yeah. Because one of them's not tried at all and has played safety shots and done nothing of any yeah. risk and therefore he hasn't failed but he hasn't done anything of value either. Yes. And then you've got another guy that's put himself out there a little bit, taken a few risks and 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 failed by definition. Yeah. But has performed better. But the the other ones have in my view, just the biggest failure because he's he doesn't know what his potential is. He's you know because he's not willing to challenge himself yeah. and always playing. And he may not fail, but he may not succeed either. So no, I think you've got to be the other other side to exactly to to be you know especially world class at anything and you know reach your your peak and your potential with that. Mm. But yeah, it's um mm. it's the big thing at Pez, isn't it? That we're we're hot and is trying to. You know, it's difficult to explain to parents, but we we want all the children that come to Pezzas, whether it's our multi-sports or football or, or futsal club, anything we do, 
is we will try and help develop uh, a growth mindset which they can then use in other areas of their life because it does transcend between Absolutely. everything. If you've got a growth mindset at football, you can have a growth mindset in your classroom yep. and in, in other areas of your life. And that's the big difference between what we do and what other football clubs do, which is why we can be making a real good stride with a kid and then he'll go and play for someone's dad in a football club because they want him to help him win games of football or something. And think, oh, no, he's, he's doing so well. And then you see him a couple of years, they've gone completely backwards. Yeah. And that's the biggest frustration in our work, isn't it? Sometimes I wish I didn't know growth mindset. Honestly, I really yeah. do. Because it kind of destroys you a bit, doesn't it, Jeff? sometimes? Well, we want them to come and make mistakes and learn from them. And then, yeah. I guess, the dad that doesn't quite know about this will want to cut those mistakes out when we win a few games yeah. and, and you just think oh, that's what coaching done is all the good work. it's set in an environment where kids can come and make mistakes yeah. and then how you teach the kids to deal with those mistakes and use mistakes as a positive to develop and get better yeah. if you're going to a club, no offence to them because they're worth their weight in gold but whose team is run by a willing dad who's not that too much bothered about looking into things in depth yeah they will probably have a no-mistake culture. So they'll set up drills where no mistakes are made. Mm -hmm. And if they are made, they then get shouted at. You've made a mistake because of this, you've made a mistake because of that. Um, Coaching is about setting up the environment where they know they can make mistakes and they're accepted. And to make good coaches, put on drills so that kids make most mistakes possible. Because then you can pick the bones out of it Mm -hmm. and you can improve it and you can get the challenge level right. And That's what coaching is. And... It's difficult to get across to a lot of people, isn't it? What people want, the perfect drills and the perfect sessions and all of that. And it's nonsense. If I, see, I see it on Instagram, all these perfect sessions that people have put on and no mistakes. And doesn't it look beautiful? I think, well, they're rubbish. Yeah. None of, they're they going through the motions. You haven't challenged them. Yeah. You, you've done a drill that's for everybody and not individual. Mm-hmm. So some of them are probably really advanced and some of them aren't. And you've pitched it somewhere in the middle so that it looks fancy. And yeah. the parents love it. And it's, it's that culture that we hate. You know, bring them to us, we'll make them make loads of mistakes and we'll yeah. challenge them and we'll push them onto that. I think you can link level. that to the analysis topic that okay, we spoke yeah. about. So how um, play, and I like to see players being intrigued by mistakes that they yeah. make. So almost being totally open to them, not pretending like they didn't happen, but yeah. thinking, actually, what did I do? What actually happened there that went wrong and what do I need to do? But that's when the magic happens. Mm. When a kid buys into it, you'll see his level go up massively because he's challenging and challenging himself and he wants to be challenged more. And when it all goes wrong, he actually laughs about it. Yeah. And that's beautiful while well, most of them do. But that's why we started our academy, which was to try and put like-minded children with a growth mindset all together to create an accelerated learning environment. Yeah. In the huddle from Peza Street Soccer.